Dr. Jaitanya Prakash Yogi, Director Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, Dr. B.P. Singh, Ms. Deshni Pale, Mr. Tembi Inkosi Inkobo, Mr. Omar Isak, Professor Jack Whitehead, Ms. Shisti Harinarayan, Mr. Piyush Kandewal, distinguished online guests, on behalf of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India in Durban, it gives me great pleasure to invite you to today's program, Pushta Kalok, a discussion on Dr. B.P. Singh's book, When the Chalk is Down. To begin today's program, I would like to invite the author, Dr. B.P. Singh, for his introductory remarks. Dr. Bhuvan Prakash Singh, served as an educator from 1985 to principal in 1997 at various Durban, sorry, at various urban and rural schools, served as North Durban Regional and Pine Town District Deputy Chef, Chief Education Specialist for exams and quality assurance from 1999 to 2005. He also served as a Deputy Director of Communication for KZN Department of Sports and Recreation from 2005 to 2015. He currently serves as Deputy Director of Policy, Planning, Strategy and Research for KZN Department of sport and recreation. He is currently representing conversion of rental houses to the ownership scheme for approximately 161 families in Terence Park in Barilum. He has authored a novel titled When the Chalk is Down, an Odyssey published in 2010. The novel has won many accolades and has been initiated many secondary programs of special note. It is now being awarded the Etiquani 2016-17 One City, One Book Accolade. The novel is currently being produced as a docudrama as a result of its authenticity and historical value. Dr. B. P. Singh serves on the steering committee of UNESCO program for the Etiquani municipality, with the committee function being the creation of the UNESCO advisory community Committee for the Municipality, Dr. B.P. Singh. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. Um, namaste, namaskar, uh, assalamu alaikum, hello, sawbona to all uh, my fellow colleagues, as well as the panelists, and a special thank you to the Indian Consulate based in Durban for this opportunity to have a discussion on the novel. Uh, just a few introductory comments to say that the book was launched in 2010 by Professor Jack Whitehead, one of our erstwhile panelists on screen uh, from London at the time. And uh, I think it enjoyed a bit of an international launch. The story is based on low cost housing for my parents and a 30 year fight to actually get the title deeds for mum in particular. So the story spans from 1969 to 2008. And what inspired the writing of the story was the struggles and the trauma that my parents suffered whilst trying to get the very first house onto their name. And I think as with all old people, the issue of owning a house is more than just owning something with brick and cement and mortar, but it's a sense of identity. And that's what they strive for, to say, we belong here, we belong in South Africa, we've lived here, we will die here, and we need to be part of this land. And because of the panel discussion, I would say to you that on the day, 30 years later, when I gave her the title deeds, she had actually lost her memory. And to me, it was good as me having failed in the 30 year fight. It was at that point I decided that her story needs to be told. So the story is told with a lot of fervor, with a lot of anger with a lot of emotion so it's written as is it's not been uh, colored in any way to be palatable to any particular person you know and subsequently the content i had saved for the time became the content of the story uh, the story itself is also a lot about relationships because in this period 
of my life which spanned personal and professional uh, aspects. I made lifelong friends. Some of people represented by Mr. Isaac, for example, who's one of our panelists. People that actually inspired and spurred me on to carry on that fight. It also made me in, get involved in a lot of community activities, which is still happening up to today with the Trends Park issue, for example. And I'm of the firm belief that it's very difficult for one to separate your personal life from your professional life. And when I look back at the telling of the story, I myself have seen how one impacted on the other. And so I think that makes me a human being, it makes all of us human beings because we are all fallible. And the story itself, while I've told it, it actually belongs to many people. I just happened to write the story. Many people have actually commented on how this book actually told their story. I just happened to write it. So that gives me a lot of spirit and uh, belief that there was some merit in it because some of us may think things, but we don't articulate them. And I'm a firm believer that if you don't say what's on your mind, no one else is going to say it for you. Of course, with it would come some friends, with it would come some antagonism, etc. but that's all part of putting yourself out there. But I am a strong believer that we need to tell our stories. We have such rich stories. And I'm also glad to say that it's attracted a lot of attention from people like Professor Jack Whitehead from an academic point of view. There have been a few of his masters and doctoral uh, seminars that have mentioned the book now and then. People like uh, Mr. Temin Kozin Lobo, who's the head of Itikwini, who will talk to you just now, who's looked at it from a government point of view as well, to say that the story has something to offer our city, our province, and our country. And that's why at this point in time, with the Film Commission, it's actually being scripted for a movie, the first draft being uh, accepted. And now, of course, it's in the review stage. So this was a few words I want to say to you that the professional life impacts on the personal life and vice versa. I'm glad we have other panelists because they will actually give you their take on it. But uh, I'll leave it over to you, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bibi Singh, for sharing your humble beginnings with us. Our next guest speaker is Ms. Deshni Pillay, Acting Deputy Principal at Terence Park Second Primary School. She has completed her PhD in education, and her topic is entitled Perspectives of, Perspectives of Educators in Leadership and Conflict Handling Situations in the Phoenix Circuit. She will be representing her paper in London. She has also received the Women of Wonder Award in 2018, the Visionary Award in 2019, and I Am Women Award in 2019. She was a finalist for the Women of Stature Education Category 2020 that was held in Johannesburg on the 8th of March, 2020. She has also received the Golden Key Award from UKZN for the academic excellence. She is currently a nominee for She is Fabulous for the Public Figure Award and also a nominee in the Business and Leadership Award. Her passion is uplifting learners that attend Terence Park Primary School and the community she serves in. She has also started an early act club at her school through Amschlanger Rotary Club. This provides learners with leadership skills. Learners are now involved in various fundraising drives that help the less fortunate in their school and community. She is also an activist with regards to gender-based violence, currently involved with One Woman Pact on a rollout program for 2020 on gender-based violence. Her involvement in all these organizations have helped her with the regard, regard to assisting her school and learners at large. She lives by the coat of our late President Nelson Mandela. Education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. Greetings, everyone. Thank you, Cheryl, for that. Um, yes, I am currently the acting deputy principal at Trinidad Primary School, which is situated in Verulam and in an impoverished area in KZN. I am also 
uh, Union member, the Education Convener for the South African Democratic Teacher Union, SATU, in the Phoenix branch. Uh, making reference to the author Dr. B.P. Singh's book, When the Chalk is Down, this book speaks to what we as educators experience on a daily basis in schools. I make reference to the author who was strong in his belief in terms of the injustice that his colleagues and him experienced by the school management team. His forthright manner and the drive for justice was a quality I can relate to as a unionist. I can identify with his fight for justice in terms of the dictatorship rule. Sad to say that 27 odd years into democracy, nothing much has changed in the schools in terms of management. Staff rooms are no more the hive of the buzz like it used to be in Forest Haven. The power of the principal is still something that many schools have issues with to date. Principals are still autocratic in the manner in which they lead. Educators do not have a voice. It's not like the days of BPC and his colleagues who had a voice and refused to be silenced. And I can identify with that. Staff unity, as mentioned in the book, when it came to fighting issues, were very strong. This does not exist in many schools, as educators are too afraid to speak due to the fact of being victimized. I draw on Dr. B.P. Singh's book as a guide on how he handles situations and also his perseverance of being heard. I make reference to, the co to, the, uh, to this and I quote, the most powerful benefit brought to a Satu member was empowerment. Indeed, as a Satu diehard member, you are schooled in a university as this organization constantly empowers you. He further refers to, and I quote, this phenomenon caused much tension at school level as members of school management were forced to transform from the management style of dictatorship to rank pulling to a system of management that they believed threatened their very own positions. And I would like to make reference to an incident that transpired in 1993 and I have the highest regard for Mr. Gabi Modli, who is also an educator at Dientist Primary currently, where he was spoken to in a very bad manner in front of his colleagues. And BP took this matter up with him to represent him and where he instructed the principal to apologize. However, the principal was adamant. And this is what I really like where BP threw to him, point three point five of the Code of Sato Code of Conduct, stating that if you do not apologize, you would be charged. And BP walked out of the room. And what happened? Yes, the principal did fall under pressure, and he did apologize. Now, for Gavi Modli and Mr. Se Dr. Singh, this was victory, not victory only for them, but for the entire staff. Now, as a unionist, my uh, passion for this is ongoing. I have instilled in all educators from my staff to all other educators in Phoenix that this book is something that they need to read. This, is book, this book will empower them on how to handle situations. Remember that we have no longer the educators from 1980s and 1990s where unity was strong and where battles were, fa uh, where, were fought issues rather than fighting personalities. So my stance is that every educator out there should read this book. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Deshni Pillay. Our next guest speaker is Mr. Tembi Nkosi Nkobo. He is the head of Parks, Recreation and Culture at the Echequeni Municipality. He holds the position of Head of Parks and Recreation and Culture at the Echequeni Municipality. In this position, he is responsible for more than 4,500 staff members, staffing libraries and heritage sports development and recreation, and Parks and Leisure Cemeteries Department 
In this position, he has led the initi initiation of groundbreaking projects like One City, One Book, Archilate Africa, Etiquani Games, Living Legends, PRC Month and recognition of Etiquani as City of Literature by UNESCO. Before joining the city, he worked in the office of the then Deputy President Thabo Inbeki as Director of Youth and Policy Programs. He has vast experience in areas of policy making and research in areas of rural and urban development of agriculture and land. He has three qualifications obtained from the University of Witwatersrand and is currently studying MBA Strategy and Finance Management with UNICAF University. Thank you, Cheryl. I hope you can pick me up. Thank you. Um, uh, and greetings to uh, members of the panel. Uh, I am quite humbled to be part of this esteemed panel uh, to also discuss such a very important project um, of uh, my friend, the PPS scene, uh, which I think is quite a very important one. Um, some of you may be aware that our city um, is a, a it is recognized by UNESCO as a city of literature. Uh, and accolade really that we received, I think it was four years ago, if not three, um, and not for things that we were promising to do, but because of things that you are already doing uh, in the area of literacy and other related uh, fields that are about the celebration uh, of the world. We, we're given this because, among other things, of initiatives that you made reference to when you introduced me. Um, one of them, for instance, being One City, One Book. This is a campaign we've been running for the last five years. And when we started uh, this campaign, we noted that there was hardly an exchange of ideas or views at really a personal, if not informal level, between people of different racial groups in our city. When, for instance, I meet BP, just an, ex an example, I will meet him in a formal environment at work, and our discussions are more likely to be limited um, to work issues and so forth. And in our view, this was designed, or it's a result because of a design of the apartheid system that we lived for so long under. And this system, for me to understand it, it is about exclusion. It excluded more especially the majority of the population from being the citizens of a country, because we had no vote. But in two, we also excluded um, as laborers, as workers, who were not recognized as people who had the rights. And then thirdly, we excluded from belonging to a city. We were not recognized as citizens of a city um, and were deemed to be only coming here to provide service uh, to those who were recognized as citizens. Otherwise, then we as black people were told that we could only live in homelands. So this is my understanding of how our society was structured. But then the system was much more complicated and very sophisticated because in order to create and sustain these divisions, people were broken down further into certain other cultural and racial groups. Now, in this case, for instance, and it has always been my understanding that there were people like Bipi Singh, who are of Indian origin, 
and there were also uh, some people who were deemed to be of colored origin. And all of these people were again separated according to certain statuses. And this, most of the time, prevented any form of coalition, any form of um, units in action against the system, uh, because I would look at them as better off than me, because probably they are second uh, class citizen and I was deemed to be the third class citizen. So these divisions had no one but the system itself, people who created and wanted to sustain the system. I had never thought in my mind for a sense that someone like BP and his community would have exactly the same issues that we were faced with. And we thought on the other hand, that these were our only issues because there was a facade that was built between us. We could not share these experiences. We could not come together to fight the actual system. So that then one city, one book was then to say to people in our city, document your experiences so that you can scientifically validate these experiences, keep them for posterity, but then also begin to share as human beings as to what we actually faced and what divided us. Now, this book goes a very long way to then begin to demonstrate practically that actually issues that Indian communities faced, issues colored people faced, were the very same issues that a person who lived five kilometers or so in Bomaju Township of that person actually faced. We were not allowed to own our own homes, the homes that we rented for so many years. And also, we're not even given for that matter because we're not recognized as citizens of the country and of the city. We're not given uh, libraries, and other very other important social services. Now, through this book, I am beginning to learn now that actually I had more reason to be united with other people that I thought were of different racial groups or cultural groups than those things that divided us. And then secondly, I begin to find from them that in actual fact, their family structures were just the same as the structures that I came from, family structures that I came from. In this book, for instance, he raises an issue of how when he had to go and pursue um, uh, college education, he had to move uh, from his home and live with the extended family, his sisters and so forth. And, and that this was done, ready to negotiate uh, the issues of the time the issues of poverty, because no one family could survive on its own. So where to share the resources? And then the third issue that comes out quite clearly in, in my view, which again debunks the issue of stratification of our society and how we're made to hate each other and divide ourselves among each other, is an issue that he raises of his, um, well, one of his encounters with uh, the MEC then, uh, of sports and recreation, Mr. Um, uh, uh, Rich Bansen. Um, somewhere he makes a point uh, that may seem to be a by the way point, where he says, Rich said to him, um, I was warned about you. And actually, you are not a candidate that I preferred. And then he goes on to say, when he raised this issue, other people who were not Indian then started to get confused because they also thought Rajpans would have preferred him as an Indian um, uh, to take over this position. What then this tells you is that there were so many other contradictions, uh, even between those people that you were told they are a racial block, a racial block that belong together. And then maybe we need to go beyond this and begin to look at people as individuals and the contribution, the views they had about the society and their activism. So, so, so that then, instead of taking a notion, um, which I think uh, is a notion of people who, who want to go out and do a data research 
uh, and apply their minds, we'll begin to see people as, as blocks, racial blocks or cultural blocks, that you need to go deeper and say, what does this person as an individual actually stand for? Uh, I, is there a way that I can collaborate with them to resolve certain social, uh, social issues, political issues, or personal issues that I may be facing here? So for me, therefore, this book really, to that extent, it goes a long way to begin to achieve what we thought when we came up with the concept of one city, one book, that people must talk. And once they begin to talk, they will begin to realize that it is more than to nice than Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Timmy and Kosi and Gobo for sharing your knowledge with us. Our next guest speaker is Mr. Omar Isaac, Group CEO of Prime Media Limited. His education includes a postgraduate from drama and literature qualification from University of KZN, final year cum laude courses at Georgetown University, Washington, DC. He has worked in private and public radio and television has a producer, director, writer, current affairs anchor and presenter. He became the youngest managing director of a private radio station in South Africa in 1998. He, uh, he led East Coast Radio, the first station with multi-ethnic audience mix. East Coast Radio became the first regional station to serve 1 million listeners in 1999 with almost equal mix of white, ethnic Zulu, and Indian heritage South Africans. After a successful stint at East Coast Radio, he was promoted to head up group broadcast media assets in 2004 has an executive director on the board of the listed kakiso media limited in april 2014 he was inducted into the south african radio hall of fame in april 2018 he was promoted to the position of group ceo of prime media limited in this group role he focused on three primary strategic parts to promote position Prime Media for the challenges and opportunities presented by a constantly evolving 21st century media environment. In April 2020, having successfully repositioned Prime Media to take advantage of a new digital economic opportunities, Mr. Omar Isaac chose to leave the South African corporate environment to explore new ventures. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to talk uh, uniquely from the fact that myself and BP have had a friendship for 30 years. So not only do I know him as a professional and an author, but most importantly, I know him as a friend. And um, when you read what you read about the character in When the Chalk is Down, this is exactly the human being that I know. So there's no, you know, authors may, when they're doing something autobiographical, embellish about themselves but there's no embellishment in this book. This is BP as authentically him, uh, as exactly the way that he speaks. He's written this book from his heart. So this is a, a, a real work of uh, authenticity uh, on his part. Uh, we taught together at a, a school that, that's in the book, Forest Haven Secondary in Phoenix, and uh, that's captured in the book from chapter six onwards. But uh, for me, this story marries his journey to do the right thing for his mother with doing the right things at a very unique moment in our country, in the history of our country. Because as our country was changing, there were expectations that more would be possible. But it, didn't, it wasn't an easy journey. And his personal battle is, is juxtaposed against his professional battle against autocratic principles in the schools where he worked to ensure that teachers are treated as the professionals that they are. He fought at this time also for the complete integration of schools when some in so-called Indian schools weren't ready for it, were pushing back against it. So there was so much happening. This was a very tumultuous time. And, and BP, uh, had he not written this book, much of this 
incredible battle of his, the struggle that wasn't just a personal struggle, but a much broader struggle, the struggle to give his mother the title deeds, but also a struggle that represents the experience of so many first, second and third generation Indians in South Africa. Many of them poor, many of them who'd never managed to go beyond standard six, actually, uh, my father being one of those. And those of us who are close to BP, friends like Dan Reddy and Pravesh Devnarayan, we've holidayed with him and his family for 30 years, every single year. What does that say about this character? It means that when this man invests in friendships, those are sincere, meaningful, sustainable things for him. And that talks to this, again, his sincerity and his genuineness. There's a generosity that's ingrained in his character that drives him to do good, to offer his friendship generally, generously, to offer his support and assistance whenever it is needed, and sometimes to a fault. Um, one of the things I think, just, just a, a slight sort of a tangent, is the one thing you can never get BP to do, despite all that generosity, is be on time. And I'm very impressed that he was here today uh, <laughs> at the start uh, for this particular uh, celebration of his, his incredible achievement with this book. Now, as I wrote in the foreword of his amazing odyssey, BP has known struggle from a very young age, growing up in a poor family, and with him being the only one to graduate and make it to a tertiary institution. And this is, this is quite, uh, quite an interesting thing because I'll tell you something about the South African Indian experience. It's rooted in a, in a community that values education very, very highly. And yet so many in that first and second generation weren't able to proceed beyond a standard six education, sometimes never beyond matric. Some of that, in fact, a lot of that was because of economic hardship. It just wasn't the money to support their children being able to achieve their ambitions. And you would have read in the book that um, BP achieved academically sufficiently to be able to go to medical school. And of course, that would have made his parents proud. We know this whole, there's a trope about Indian parents and doctors as children. <laughs> it's obviously very true. They, the, that is the number one thing. If your child can become a doctor, then you are the proudest parent in the community. And BP wasn't able to do that, not because of any other deficit except the lack of funding. And yet his parents never got to see that Dr. BP Singh did emerge finally. Although it wasn't a doctor of medicine, it was a doctor in another area, which again shows that passion among Indian heritage people to do the best they can to study and grow and improve their lot, no matter where they are, anywhere in the world. So that upbringing that he had, his, his mom and dad, poor as they were, one of the things that you admire in this book is how BP rises among, uh, rises above a certain other characteristic that I'm very familiar with, and I know this from my own father. One of the things that first and second generation Indians um, were victims of is their own lack of authority. So in the presence of whether it's a traffic policeman or whether it's an administrative official, many Indian people of first and second generation were cowed in front of authority. They didn't feel that they had the confidence to speak up. They did as they were told by people in authority. And had that remained the way that third and fourth generation Indians behaved in this country, I don't think as much would have been achieved. They joined the struggle to liberate this country because as the third and fourth generation emerged, as some in second generation started to do, they stood up to this authority. And BP, in that microcosm of his own experience, shows that rising confidence of second, third generation Indians in particular, who were saying, I don't have to be cowed in the way that my father and my mother were. And you see this so many times in the character of his mother in the book. And she represents so many other Indian heritage people in this country who, in the face of authority, think that the only way to achieve is to, sorry to use this term, curry favor, to be quiet, to be subservient, to bow down. And obviously, you know, that particular approach achieves very little in the face of bureaucrats and administrators. And BP was the one who broke out of that shackle, those shackles that so many of second generation, third generation Indians have, and stood up when he felt that there was something that he needed to do to achieve, not for himself, because remember a lot of these things that he does, 
you could say that it's for himself, but it was for his mother. That's what drove it. And later on, it's for the benefit of his colleagues and his peers. And today, it's for the benefit of the community in Trenance Park. And this experience that he talks about, this, this struggle to get the title deeds, while it's located from 1960s through to the 1990s, that is an experience. Tim Benkosi spoke about it earlier. It's an experience that South Africans have to this day. I know people who work in menial jobs, who have a little plot of land in places like Tembisa and Ivory Park, on which they have built a little concrete block, one room, one bath toilet, little place, and all they yearn for is a title deed. The land that they own or, or that they occupy is not in an industrial area, it's not standing in the way of a highway, and yet today, bureaucracy, governments, provincial and local government struggle to hand over a title deed. And yet it is so simple. It gives people, it imbues in people who get it, a sense of belonging in their communities and belonging in their lands, where they feel whole as a citizen. And yet that experience today continues to be a struggle in a liberated, free, democratic South Africa that so many fought for. But that struggle is not at an end. It continues. And therefore, this book's relevance will continue for generations. And not just in South Africa, and Professor Whitehead talked about us talking about our local, lo local experiences. This issue of how administrators and bu bureaucrats seem to be engineered to frustrate citizens rather than serve them is not a unique experience to South Africans. It exists across this continent and across the world. And as I mentioned earlier, education is at, at the heart of this Indian heritage experience in South Africa. It plays a central role in the book, but it also, in the book, dealing with such serious issues allows for moments of amusement. It sort of creates a bit of light and shade in the book when you see uh, his playfulness, uh, as he calls it, his naughtiness uh, with, with his peers. But we also see how in that classroom, apart from being a teacher, he also grows in his own maturity as a protagonist through interaction with his peer group. There are people who teach him about the politics of the country from which, as he quite rightly says, he was um, not necessarily immersed when he was growing up. He was sheltered. But by going to the school in Newcastle and, and interacting with the Dowji sisters, suddenly there was this awakening and understanding of the struggles in this country that he felt that he'd not been exposed to and very protected from. But that allowed him to grow and learn and develop his own maturity and his own sense of self and his own belief in the fact that when he was doing the things he needed to do to help his mother get her title deeds, he was doing the right thing. He was fighting the same kind of oppression that had been in this country since the colonizers arrived. BP's positioned himself as a lifelong learner. He drove this drive in him, allowed him to get his MBA and his PhD. And so he is today Dr. Singh. But that's not the measure of what this man is in my eyes. All of the academic accolades are one thing. But the thing I admire most about the BP Singh I know is how this man in a world that has abhorrent acts of gender-based violence, and we see it in our own country. This is a man who brings up three daughters, and he gives them the ability to express themselves and choose their own path. There are many in the Indian community, if we think about the conservatism of Indian communities, where there are daughters who are meant to stay at home, who are meant to be wives, who have a specifically defined purpose, B.P. Singh rises above that as, and you wouldn't think it when you look at him, but a liberal parent who says that my daughters can chart their own path, they can be architects of their own destiny. And he doesn't impose any particular role for them. And that is an incredible thing to admire and treasure and celebrate in B.P. Singh, the author and the human being and the man. And not only again with his daughters, but with his wife, his wife, who is strong-willed and independent, she, in fact, if, for those of you who don't know this, is the publisher of this book. She runs her own business. And so uh, you admire this about a man who lives in a community that can be fairly conservative in the way that it views so many things, whether it's religion, whether it's the role of women. BP has broken free of all of that. He has allowed his daughters and his wife to be themselves. And I admire that. 
And I think that that hopefully is captured also in the chalk is down, in when the chalk is down. Um, and I'm very, very proud uh, to call uh, Dr. VP Singh my friend. Thank you, Mr. Omar Isaac, for those words. Our next guest speaker is Professor Jack Whitehead, visiting professor at the University of Cumbria. Ms. Professor Jack Whitehead is a living educational theorist based in UK. Previously at the University of Bath, she is now the visiting professor at the University of Krumba, UK. He originated the idea that individuals could create their own explanations of the educational influences in their own learning, in the learning of others, and in the learning of social formations in which their inquiries are located. As their living educational theories, he pioneered the use of digital multimedia narratives for clarifying and evolving the means of expression of embodied values in explanations of educational influence in research degrees. The results of his website are an international resource for action researchers who are generating their own living theories with values that carry hope for the flourishing of humanity from inquiry of the kind. How can I improve what I am doing? Okay, thank you. Um, am I unmuted? Can you hear? Yes, you can hear. That's great. No, thank you for that uh, introduction, Cheryl. And it's really good, and I, I feel really pleased to be participating with you and to see BP Ping uh, sing again, because it was 10 years that uh, I was part of the book launch of When the Chalk is Down. And I was saying what a remarkable text that book was. And um, I want to focus on this integration between the personal and the professional within When the uh, Chalk is Down. Because the, the originality of that book is to do with the way BP communicated the values that he holds as an educator. But also then he located himself within South Africa and some of the values to do with land reform that were violating his notion of social justice. So you have a narrative which integrates both the personal values of that long, many years battle to gain justice in relation to land reform, whilst at the same time having a narrative of the autobiography of BP's learning as he went through many different contexts and still retaining a desire to improve the education of young people and others in South Africa. So I want to focus on the significance of the text not only in South Africa, this is important because I can see that from all of your locations and what you're interested in, you will have a, um, a desire to bring the influence of the text into South Africa in local communities, in the schools, and also within the culture of South Africa. And when 10 years ago, I was also involved in giving the inaugural lecture, the Nelson Mandela lecture at Durban, University of Technology, I was able to focus on the South African notion of Ubuntu, which actually Nelson Mandela had actually ensured was in the constitution of South Africa. Now, what strikes me about what BP Singh enabled in that text has significance, I think, way beyond South Africa. And it's that that I just want to focus on because I've examined quite a number of theses in different universities in the world where, for example, the notion of cosmopolitanism is focused on. The latest doctorate to get through was last month at the University of Lancaster on a living educational theory of international development. Now, what BP Singh has accomplished, and this is why I want to suggest that we can all help to communicate the significance of this text. We could do this as a community because this will be broadcast on Saturday in terms of our conversation. And we could all just watch and actually work together in a community to spread the influences of these ideas. 
you could do it very locally within a South African context. You could do it, as I say, locally within your context, uh, regionally and also nationally. And a number of us would actually take it international in terms of its influence because the values base of the text is very much coming from that sense, not only of Ubuntu in the sense of I am because we are, it, 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 as previous speakers have said, it doesn't just focus on whether you are um, an African, whether you have got that cultural history, whether you've got a cultural history as Hindu. Uh, for example, uh, I know Durban, I've got a large gathering, uh, for example, from a Hindu context, and I've been working with researchers in India <coughs> who've also got that kind of spiritual um, focus in terms of what they are doing. So I think that what BBC has accomplished is bringing together within what I would call a global educator. Now, this has been very important to me to try to spread the influences of the values of BBC into these global contexts, which I'm, my workshops have gone into different countries. I've examined these living theory doctorates in many different universities, and it is trying to link the kind of qualities that I believe everybody here will want to support, but not only within our own local communities, but also internationally as well. And that's why I want to just focus. I know some of you will, uh, if you like, not want to emphasize the professional and really focus on your communities, but I do want to focus on the scholarship and the intellectual rigor in the text of when the chalk is down. Because BP Singh explicitly embraced that idea of living educational theory, where he was showing an explanation of his educational influence as he lived his values in searching to overcome the social injustice of the land reform, but at the same time expressing hope and a passion and a commitment to improve things through being a professional educator and also later in administration. Now, those values I'm claiming and come into the global context of being a global educator. And in South Africa, you have a history of focusing on what it is to be an educator, what it is to be a professional educator. You've moved beyond the concept of, of being a teacher, and you really do focus on being an educator. And it's this quality, I think, of when the chalk is down. It's an act to show how in different global contexts, we can all produce a narrative, a story of our learning as we try to live our values as fully as possible. I hope I'm making sense here because each one of us on the screen at the moment has got our own unique constellation of values that make us who we are. But we are also all trying to live these values within our own unique contexts. And our narratives, like when the chalk is down, and show us that we can all create our own stories and share those and build a strength and a very strong community of what we're actually trying to do as educators with these values. And BP Singh has literally shown us, it's a beautiful text, the actual elegance and the quality of the communication is actually outstanding. You know, the integration of the images within the narrative, the themeless way in which the narratives of the professional educator are integrated with the passionate in right as a son trying to make sure that social justice is done to parents over 25 to 30 years. And it's a marvelous text of perseverance and courage. So it's that that I was actually trying to focus on. Certainly 10 years ago, when I just launched help with the book launch, I was trying to say what an important text this was in terms of the global communities. So I'm just hoping that this is, if you like, a game, because I haven't met uh, on the screen at the moment, you know, there's only BP Singh that I've actually, I've met. Whereas now it's a delight to see you all supporting when the chalk is down, so that we can see what we might do together, possibly, and check with each other how we're being accountable to spreading the messages within when the chalk is down. Okay? That's great. And many thanks for the opportunity to participate with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Jack Whitehead. 
thoughts. Now that we have come to the end of today's program, we will have vote of thanks by Ms. Shisti Harinarayan. Namaskar. On behalf of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India in Durban, it gives me great thanks. It gives me great honor in rendering this afternoon's vote of thanks on this very informative program, Push the Lok, a discussion on Dr. B. P. Singh's book, When the Chalk is Done. We would like to express deep gratitude to Dr. B. P. Singh, Ms. Deshni Pillay, Mr. Tembi Inkosi Inkobo, Mr. Omar Esak, Professor Jack Whitehead, the director of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, Dr. Chaitanya Prakash Yogi, Ms. Cheryl Banwarilal, Mr. Piyush Kandalwal. Distinguished guests, thank you for watching this program and kindly stay tuned to SBCC social media pages for what's happening next. Namaste.